A few months ago, while working on this presentation, I was asked by a colleague to do a consultation needed for forensic purposes. I will tell the story in short and later return to insights relevant to this talk. We had to deliver an expert opinion in the case of a young woman, aged 20 to 23 or 24, accused of having murdered her children. The story was terrible and it had many echoes on the news. A young woman from a Bedouin settlement in the south of the country waited for her husband to leave for work and then killed her three children. The story went even further. It seemed that she killed her baby child, then the brother, who was age two or three, no, he was age one or two. The eldest child, age two or three, ran away crying that mother was beating him. He was met by good willing neighbors who calmed the child down and took him back to his mother who killed him soon afterwards. Well, I was sure I was, I was going to meet a kind of a modern Medea, an evil sorceress motivated by who knows what dark motivations, or at least a very disturbed non-human monster. I was surprised to meet a young woman, clean, tidy, good-looking, even coquette. She spoke good Hebrew, not very common with young Bedouin women. She came from a traditional family, went to school, graduated from high school, again not very common. She hoped to become a nurse, maybe even a doctor. Actually, she had good grades, and had she applied, could have been considered and had good chances to be accepted to one of our medical schools. But before she could understand it, at the age of 17, forced by her family and traditions, she found herself married to a cousin 20 years her senior. Soon afterwards, she was pregnant, and then again and again, and her husband would leave for work early in the morning, return late in the evenings. She was surrounded by lots of family members around, expecting her to behave. Eventually, she discovered that her husband was on the verge of taking a second wife. Now, for years, she had a kind of a genie, a kind of evil spirit talking to her, saying dirty words, pushing her to commit suicide, or alternatively, kill her husband or her children. And she struggled with this voice. But it became more and more present, more difficult to resist, and one day she gave in. She submitted to the genie. Was she sick? Was she schizophrenic? Was she supposed to be declared incompetent to stand trial? How and if at all are Jung's teachings helpful today in spreading light on this human tragedy? I will come back to this question later on my talk. Modern psychiatry began with the French Revolution, and probably the first modern psychiatrist was the French, was the French phys physician, Auguste Pinel. Being a man in the spirit of his time, Pinel, Pinel believed that the natural human condition is to be free. It is to be responsible for one's fate, to be able to make choice, choices, and to give meaning to one's life. Mad ones, the so-called lunatics, were those who, due to a brain disease, became alienated from their true nature. Due to their disease, he claimed, they became unable to decide on their future. According to Pinel, treating the alienated is not only curing their brain disease, but helping them to become real, real human beings again, free people. <clears throat> well, with this ideology in mind, the first modern psychiatric hospitals were founded. In a way, we are all Pinel's followers today, but only to some extent. We all believe that for someone to be mentally ill, there must be some underlying brain pathology, a certain inherent vulnerability. But we tend to disregard the other aspects of Pinel insights. And indeed, <clears throat> nowadays, when a person dear to us is afflicted with serious disease, take cancer, for example, we all encourage him to fight for his, for his health, to be brave, to go through painful treatments. A strong spirit, so we believe, will make the difference in many cases. Well, unfortunately, not always, but in many cases, between a terminal disease and more and more often a serious but treatable condition. But when a person dear to us is diagnosed with schizophrenia, most of us will have pity on him and on his relatives. We will look upon him as a victim to his brain pathology, and at most, we will encourage him to comply with the doctor's advice, take medications, etc. We do not tend to encourage him to fight for his sanity. 
it is on this aspect of schizophrenia that is so refreshing to recall Jung teachings. The 21st century research in the field of mental illness is characterized by enormous human efforts. The investment of enormous financial resources and breathtaking discoveries in areas such as human genetics, biochemistry, epidemiology, imaging. But the question remains, does our widened understanding of brain functioning in health and in disease have sufficient <coughs> impact on the destiny of the individual? <clears throat> Before taking a short tour d'horizon of the current state of the art in the field of schizophrenia, let us remind ourselves once more the Jungian perspective. This term schizophrenia was coined by Bleuler in 1908 in the Burkholz Lee Hospital in Zurich. I probably do not pronounce the name of the hospital correctly, but everyone knows what I'm talking about. This term was a reaction to the dementia precox syndrome coined by his contemporary colleague Kreppelin from Germany because if to quote, Blo to quote Bleuler, today we include patients whom we would neither call demented nor exclusively victims of deterioration early in life. The term he referred to was to a disease process characterized by a destruction of the internal connections of the personality, a specific alteration of thinking, feeling, and volition in relation to the external world. In its course, the personality loses its unity and the integration of different complexes is lacking. The course of the disease is at times chronics, chronic, a time marked by intermittent attacks, which can stop, retrograde at any stage, but does not permit a full restitutio ad integrum. And Bleuler discerned between fundamental symptoms in areas such as thinking, feeling, and volition, and secondary, probably compensatory symptoms, such as delusions and hallucinations. For Jung, the research and the understanding of the psychotic process is fundamental in the formation and consolidation of analytical psychology. His papers on the field of schizophrenia are sp spread over, over all his productive years. This weakening of willpower expresses itself in a way that a train of thoughts is not carried out to its logical conclusion, but is interrupted by strange contents that are insufficiently inhibited. As a result of this lowering of consciousness, complex contents take over, and the predominance of ego con consciousness is endangered. In contrast to neurotic conditions where complexes maintain a connection to the ego and the unity of the personality is maintained, in schizophrenia, this connection can be completely lost. In schizophrenia, this, the disconnected complexes will never integrate to the psychic totality or, if they can join together in remission, it will be like a mirror broken into splinters. Some important essentials regarding Jung's theory of schizophrenia. The lowering of the level of consciousness reaches depth which are rarely reached in neurotic conditions while releasing, discharging, and constellating deep archetypal collective materials which were inhibited and suppressed by the ego. Naturally, these conditions remind us of dreaming, particularly of big dreams experienced on the crossroads of our existence. And indeed, much similarity exists between psychosis and dreaming. It was Jung's original contribution to understand psychosis as a dream without sleep, or to put it in his words, the dreamer is normally insane, or that insanity is a dream which has replaced consciousness. I will bring down an example of a fragment from a dream and a fragment from the narrative of an acutely psychotic patient which will show the similarity. I read the first paragraph. Then I'm with S and other unknown girls in some kind of a new house, modern, rich, and everything, the room, ceiling, etc., is round. Between the rooms there are no doors, just glass, and everything is transparent. Suddenly, I don't know how, what happens, but I'm alone. On the floor, there are some triangular, elaborate glass stones, and I realize they are not from this world. They are a little bit raised above the floor and activated by my movements. They see me. When I pass nearby, they begin to rotate and then break to thousands of sharp glass splinters in the room. I must flee to another room. I realize the stones were evil and they aimed at killing me. I tried to run away, and while running, I activated more and more stones. 
I was running from room to room, activating more and more glass stones. I felt exhausted, moving from room to room, and I felt I was going to die. Second paragraph now. And every night, D, my husband, as if putting S, my son, to bed, he kills him, and in the morning resurrects him. Now, without knowing the context, it will not be easy to guess what is what, what will be a dream and what will be a narrative of psychotic. And the schizophrenic complex has its peculiarities. Elements of a normal or neurotic complex are well developed, even hypertrophied, on account of their heightened energetic value. The schizophrenic complex is characterized by a peculiar deterioration and disintegration, leaving the field of attention undisturbed. It looks as if, in schizophrenia, the complexes are destroying themselves by distorting their own contents. These complexes do not seem to draw energy from other mental processes, but devour their own energy, subsiding their own foundation and leaving the, per the personality impoverished or residual, if to put it in modern words. Whereas the neurotic dissociation never loses its systematic character, schizophrenia shows a picture of unsystematic randomness in which continuity of meaning is often mutilated to the point of unintelligibility. The picture of personality dissociation in schizophrenia is different from what's seen in other situations. The split of figures assume grotesque, persecutory, or highly exaggerated names and characters. They do not cooperate with the ego consciousness and often torment it. There is an apparent chaos of visions and voices and characters overwhelming and strange. In schizophrenia, this abaissement reaches a degree never heard of in neurosis. The very foundation of the personalities are, impa are impaired, and normally inhibited contents of the unconscious are now allowed to invade consciousness. But this problem of the lowering of the level of consciousness and what is more important, the personal attitude, the individual attitude towards it, is for me the main lesson to be taken from Jung's teaching. I quote. From Jung, from 1939. Any abysmal, one that leads to neurosis, means a weakening of the supreme control. A neurosis is a relative dissociation, a conflict between the ego and the resistant force based upon unconscious contents. But every neurotic fights for the supremacy of ego consciousness and for the subjugation of unconscious forces. A patient who allows himself to be swayed by the intrusion of strange contents from the unconscious. A patient who identifies with and does not fight with, or is even fascinated by the morbid elements, exposes himself to the suspicion of schizophrenia by being fascinated by regression. The abasement can reach an extreme degree where the ego loses all power. Paragraph 10, a short illustration to emphasize this point. M, a young professional in his late 30s, was referred to me a few months after the birth of his firstborn son. He had previously accompanied his wife in the maternity room. The delivery was complicated and evolved to a forceps procedure. He witnessed the gynecologist in his work with his hands inside his wife's body. He saw the blood. Little by little, he felt more and more humiliated. He felt his wife being defiled. He could not be intimate with her anymore. He began to develop strange and hostile beliefs towards men gynecologists. And he had murderous drives towards her doctor and he began to walk around his house considering to attack him. He had recurrent visions of his wife being torn to pieces in the hospital and more and more felt the urge to save society from what he perceived as pervert, wicked gynecologists. And yet, he felt something went wrong. And whenever he felt overwhelmed by his visions and by his aggressive impulses, he would bite himself. He, actually, he would make himself bleed so that the physical pains would weaken his fantasies and would put him back in touch with reality. One day, he was so tormented by these inner destructive powers that he had to leave his office. He sat in a public garden, biting and talking loudly to himself. As he drew attention, he was approached by a policeman who wanted to refer him to the nearest psychiatric emergency room. 
Well, luckily for him, he managed to avoid, the, to avoid being hospitalized. And I said, luckily, because we can imagine that had he been admitted to a hospital, of course, he would have been put under heavy surveillance. He probably would have been heavily medicated, probably diagnosed, and in a serious danger of initiating the schizophrenic pup. I will come back to M as to the first patient later on my talk. And now, paragraph 11, to what schizophrenia is in the ear of the brain and to the actual research endeavors. As a definition, schizophrenia is a devastating psychiatric syndrome with a median lifetime morb morbid risk of 7.2 per thousand, a little less than 1% of prevalence. The age of onset is typically in adolescence or early adulthood, with onset after the, the fifth decade and in childhood, both being great. All cause mortality is elevated approximately 2.6 fold for patients with schizophrenia, with excess death mainly from suicide during the early phases of the disorder and later from cardiovascular complications. Schizophrenia commonly has a chronic course, albeit with fluctuating patterns and cognitive disability. Its hallmark is psychosis, mainly characterized by positive symptoms, particularly hallucinations and delusions, frequently accompanied by negative deficit symptoms such as reduced emotions, speech, and interest, and by disorganization of speech and behavior. This slide shows us the current DSM definition of the syndrome, showing how far we are today from the original Blolerian definition. The original definition looked upon delusions and hallucinations, you see the main, the main points, as not necessary attributes of the disease in contrast to the four fundamental symptoms, autism, associated ambivalence, and defect. For Jung, these secondary symptoms are to be understood as having a psychogenic origin. Now, what is interesting that this quotation is from a letter to the chairman of Symposium on Chemical Concepts of Psychosis held at Zurich in September 1957 meaning five years after the introduction of the first modern neuroleptic drugs, meaning we are already in the beginning of the so-called era of the brain. Is schizophrenia an inherited condition? Up to date, over 1,000 genes have been tested for association with the disease. The hope is that finding one gene or an association of genes would give, would give way to identifying a specific protein which is in the background of the disturbance. As the research deepens, it becomes more and more clear how difficult, how difficult it is to investigate this condition that we call schizophrenia. On clinical ground, it shares clinical features with a range of other psychiatric disorders and need to be diagnosed with high accuracy. And on the other hand, the transcription of protein is much more complicated than previously predicted even if genes involved with psychiatric illness are identified. We should keep in mind that even between monozygotic twins <coughs> sharing exactly the same genetic load, there is only less than 50% concordance for schizophrenia. Another field of research is the developing field of brain imaging. It is a second area which raises high expectations. The living structure and the functioning brain seen in real time are a challenge to the hope of understanding what went wrong. Actually, we have ways of beginning to grasp the functioning brain, but whether these findings neglect the patient by concentrating on his brain or they will help us to understand psychotics is still to be found out. Paragraph 14. <clears throat> a new generation of psychotrop drugs, psychotropic drugs appeared on the market at the beginning of the 90s. They were supposed to be the next pharmacological revolution after the first one, which took place in the 50s of the last century with the introduction of the first modern neuroleptic drugs. They acted on actually new categories of neurotransmitters and were expected to be more efficient and almost lacking side effects. The launch was accompanied by a worldwide aggressive campaign by the, by the pharmaceutical companies with abundant money and gifts, more or less under disguise, distributed to institutions and psychiatrists in order to encourage their introduction. This second generation of antipsychotics, albeit much more expensive, have become nowadays the first line of treatment. 
but with them, new classes of side effects not encountered before emerged. So today, no more the Parkinsonian patients, so typical to the old psychiatric worlds, but more obese patients nowadays, in risk to develop diabetes, hyperlipidemias, and other cardiovascular complications. Luckily, two major studies, both of them fin financed by public funds and devoid of commercial interests, show the exact equal efficacy of the first, of the first generation of drugs, like the haloperidol, and all the other second generation of drugs, showing exactly they have exactly the same influence with different side effects. Leaving so the clinicians and the patient with a difficult choice of the least desirable side effects. Common to all these research endeavors to, con to connect brain sciences with mental disease is the effort to formulate structures and categories, be they biological or clinical. All this in contrast with, with what we do in, a, in psychoanalysis, when we still keep looking for meaning and for the personal. And the question remained, from all those afflicted with psychotic tendencies, who will become schizophrenic? And what lesson should we keep in mind in 2013 from Jung's teaching? In 1957, again five years after the first ph pharmacological revolution, he writes, the number of latent and potential psychosis is astoundingly large in comparison with the manifest cases. The problem remains who among those with, with a specific vulnerability, who will become schizophrenic and who will remit? And for me, this is the main and the most important question. And it is at this point that I want to share my personal experience of over 30 years as a practicing, practicing psychiatrist working intensively with schizophrenics. I believe that schizophrenia is the, is the disease of the poor and the unprivileged members of society. The typical schizophrenic, and of course not everyone, will be a young man or woman, generally coming from a disruptive family, often having just one active and present parent, the parent often being unemployed, alcoholic or weak, belonging to a low socioeconomic status, often originating from an immigrant family, either from a different culture or a victim of urbanization, often with minor criminal offenses, often experiencing with drugs, mainly over-the-counter drugs, often with minor neurological deficits, like attention deficits or similar, usually not being, a, not being able to afford good therapy, but, and most important, without hopes for a better future and without motivation to struggle for his sanity. Such a person, being probably constitutionally born with an inherited vulnerability, can one day, in reaction to stress or to a different life event, event decompensate to an acute psychosis or to a subclinical, what we would call prodromal one. From this point <coughs> on, the fight for the supremacy of the ego consciousness, the recruiting of the willpower against faiblesse de la volonté, so beautifully described by Jung, must be based on the perspective one could expect from regaining the reality testing, it is from eating life. What does his future offer? In a competitive, technolog technologically based stratified society, when one feels unadapted, it is so tempting to give in and to submit to the lure of the collective unconscious. Paragraph 18. <clears throat> and large epidemiological surveys sustain this thesis. Good epidemiological surveys are based on draft board registries. The Israeli National Draft Board Registry is very illuminating as it combines assessment of all adolescents with the National Registry of Psychiatric Hospitalization. Now, look, pre-morbid cognition and behavioral indices were identified in over 15,000 adolescents later hospitalized with schizophrenia. It was over 50 years, so really it is, it's a very large population. If 25% of future schizophrenics had a premorbid diagnosis, 75% didn't have. We can see that the lower the socioeconomic background, the higher will be the chance to be hospitalized and diagnosed with schizophrenia. <coughs> being an immigrant, and furthermore being an immigrant from a distant society, will be another factor as well. We can see that being an immigrant to Israel from the former USSR could be a risk factor for mental disease. 
But being an immigrant from far rural Ethiopia and having to adjust to a very different way of living would be much, much more dangerous. Back to the patients with whom I opened this presentation. I hope you still remember them. M, the young professional who accompanied his wife to the maternity room and decompensated to psychosis soon afterwards, he is by all means a courageous man. He fights for his ego consciousness. He struggles painfully to remain in touch with reality. And he has fairly good chances for his future. But on the other hand, M is Israeli born. He lives and works in the environment and in the language in which he grew up. He was brought up in a good enough functioning family. He is married and he has an average income. But maybe the most important additional factor is that he is lucky to be able to afford a reasonable good continuous therapy. The Bedouin young woman, she's in a totally different situation. For her, ego consciousness means facing an unbearable situation. For her, there's no way back. And even if there was a way, she wouldn't take it. For her, the images of the collective unconscious, even when tormenting, are a much better alternative. Paragraph 20. <clears throat> The lessons to be learned from Jung's heritage in the field of treating psychosis are multifaceted. Even inside our community, and surely in the general public, Jung is looked upon as being much of a mystic, a spiritual and religious thinker. The other aspects of his teaching, <clears throat> his being a sharp and well-grounded clinician, are often forgotten and neglected. Sometimes, he might have been overly optimistic by asserting, for example, in 1957, I, I quote, it is now about 50 years since I became convinced through practical experience that schizophrenic disturbances could be treated and cured by psychological means. Well, this is a little bit over-optimistic. But even so, now in the era of the brain, when we can look and observe the functional brain in real time, when the human genetic code divulges its secrets, when we look upon mental disease through the perspective of statistics, clusters of symptoms, cost-effectiveness, when we look at the homogeneous and not at the particular, it is especially invigorated for the therapist to remember Jung's words in 1939. Quote, the, fact, the other fact that impressed me is the discovery I made when I began my psychotherapeutic practice. I was amazed at the number of schizophrenics whom we almost never see in psychiatric hospitals. This patient insists upon treatment, and I found myself, Bloiler's loyal disciple, trying my hand on cases we never would have dreamed of touching, even, even if we had them in the clinic. Cases unmistakably schizophrenic even before treatment. I felt hopelessly unscientific in treating them at all. And after the treatment, I was told they, that they could never have been schizophrenic at all. <laughs> and he continues. Even if I'm not very hopeful about a patient, I try to give him as much psychology as he can stand because I have seen plenty of cases where the later attacks were less severe and the prognosis was better as a result of increased psychological understanding. I believe no one can doubt the, the, the relevance of this, of this sentence. There are limitations, of course, to Jung's understanding of schizophrenia. He never elaborated, for example, on the peculiarity of the schizophrenic complex, how and why it is so different energetically from the overinflated neurotic complex, and why is it self-devouring? He never elaborated on the reasons for the alienation one feels from his surroundings, luring him to give up. But he emphasized the central place of one's responsibility to one's mental sanity, and the respect we should all have for those who do not let themselves be swayed by the intrusion of those strange contents stemming from the unconscious. And thank you very much.